In the Disney cartoons, everyone knows that Mickey is a mouse and Donald is a duck, and we'd probably understand that even if we never heard their last names. But people often get confused about what Goofy is supposed to be. According to Disney, Goofy is a dog, and he looks as much like a real animal as Mickey or Donald do. The reason Goofy doesn't look like a dog to us is because Pluto is a dog too, but Pluto only has the behavior of a dog, and that creates a conceptual disconnect when we try to understand how Goofy and Pluto can both belong to the same species. This may be one reason why many people have a problem trying to understand how humans can be classified as a subset of the family of apes. But however one defines what a human is, that definition has to begin with the biology of an ape, onto which we may add our uniquely specific traits. The study of physical anthropology has many points of confusion regardless of one's level of education or acceptance of human evolution. The problem isn't just the modern meaning of the word ape, for the definition has changed over time, but also what it means to be human and how modern man relates to the rest of humanity, meaning other now extinct species which most people don't think about. When I was a kid it seemed like scientists were the only ones who didn't believe that dinosaurs were giant lizards who lived at the same time as men because the common concept of the prehistoric world was more inspired by scenes of Raquel Welch than on any actual science, and this imagery was also marketed for children. So I had this entire set of snapped together plastic pieces, including some of the later editions like the woolly mammoths, Tyrannosaurus, and the Eocene terror bird, none of which lived at the same time. I remember complaining about that and having to explain that modern men and Neanderthals did live at the same time then, because so many of the adults that I knew thought that Neanderthals were supposed to have been those half-human ape men who the evolutionists believe we allegedly evolved from. I had to explain that no scientist ever suggested that Homo sapiens descended from Homo neanderthalensis, that instead both races were like cousins with the same grandfather. Culturally, intellectually, and anatomically modern humans evidently emerged in Africa within the last hundred thousand years or so, and then followed their ancestors in waves of migrations out to the rest of the world. Neanderthals originated in Western Asia at least a quarter of a million years earlier, and then moved into Europe, and over time, their definitive characteristics became more recognizably exaggerated. Their less distinctive proto-Neanderthal ancestors were themselves descended from Homo erectus. This species had many phenotypic subsets known by several different names and were already widespread throughout the tropics of Asia and Africa where the earliest known member of our species still shared a blend of subtle traits associated with both Erectus and Neanderthals. For anyone who still doesn't understand how two sibling species could arise from a common ancestor when neither would have met the other, it works like this. There may be several different family lines cohabitating one area at one time. Over many generations, some of these will eventually diminish or die out, while others proliferate more abundantly, so that eventually all the modern denizens of that place can only trace their genealogy back a few generations before they find that they all converge on the same ancestry the rest of the way back. The same applies to the macroevolutionary scale as well. This is why the further back you trace any two visibly related lineages, the more their recessed ancestors will resemble each other, because at one time they were the same thing, and have each grown their own way since. The same pattern is reflected in the aging process. This is why the young of two closely related species look more alike than the adults do. Remember also that you can't look back on your own life and determine the hour when you had no more childish traits, but were a fully mature adult. For the same reason, even if you could view all your consecutive ancestors over a million generations, it would still be impossible to positively identify any one individual as the first human. All you would find throughout that time would be communities where individuals show only subtle variations from each other. You would not be able to recognize the year when those once unique traits came to dominate the whole tribe, nor could you ever find one generation in which no one could still interbreed with anyone from the generation before. You could find a collective of chemically interfertile contemporaries whose genetics had become so unique as to be incompatible with some of those who were thousand generations distant. Because life is not as static as folks imagine. Living designs are a fluid dynamic. When a population is divided in complete genetic isolation, unique distinctions will arise in each group and the two will grow increasingly apart. The longer this goes on, the less likely it will be to bridge the widening gap and produce viable offspring. Chemical fertility isn't always the determining factor here, either. There are instances where two species can interbreed, but prefer not to, and usually won't under normal circumstances. That may be the case here. 
Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis are very closely related, yet there was little intermingling, only about 10%. People living today show no more than 4% Neanderthal DNA, if at all, and the Neanderthal genome reveals no contribution from early sapiens. So at the very least, Neanderthals may be our best example of another breed of human. Remember that a breed or subspecies is determined by a suite of definitive traits which are shared by every member of a given lineage and which is not present in any member of a sister group. Despite cultural contentions of prejudiced politics, human diversity has not reached this level since our divergence with Neanderthals hundreds of thousands of years ago. While we may argue over whether Neanderthals had yet met all the criteria required to qualify as another species, there is no doubt but that hobbits definitely were. Homo floresiensis was unambiguously a different species even if they could interbreed with us, which they probably could, yet almost certainly didn't. While all hobbits found so far are less than 80,000 years old, their morphology implies that the race must be much older, diverging from our line at least one and a half million years ago. Because every one of them found so far shares the same primitive and definitive characteristics, many of which are not found in any of us or Neanderthals either. If Homo erectus was our grandfather and Neanderthals are our first cousins, then hobbits are our second or even third cousins, because they still have traits in their wrists and ankle bones, which were already lost in erectus and all subsequent descendants. Hobbits, then, could not have descended from Erectus. They must have diverged prior to them, perhaps from Homo habilis, one of the earliest humans and the last one still having skeletal features which are otherwise found only in Australopiths and non-human apes like chimpanzees. Hobbits were definitely not the same species as Homo sapiens or Homo erectus, but they are still generally considered human, although they were as distantly related as it is possible for another human to be. They had the smallest proportionate brain size of any human species, but the shapes of the face and the skull were definitely human, and they evidently used fire and made stone tools which are uniquely associated with them, being unlike those made by any other hominin. Of course, the hobbit's Indonesian location implies that waves of hominin migration out of Africa must have begun earlier than previously predicted. Knowing this, it is not surprising that primitive human skulls, estimated to be 1.8 million years old, were found in Western Asia. Neither is it surprising that these skulls were morphologically intermediate between Homo habilis and later Erectus. These were labeled H. georgicus, or said to be H. ergaster, or something similar. The various phenotypes named in human evolution are often difficult to distinguish. Some paleoanthropologists consider a few of these names to be significant only in cataloging the varieties and migration of early men. In this view, everything from Pithecanthropus through Homo antecessor may just be subtle varieties in a continuous chronological sequence of the same interconnected species, and the transition from them to us is blurred by the abundance of intermediate fossils throughout that series. Of course, that's not the public opinion, largely because the news media love to sensationalize scientific discoveries. It seems that a story can't be interesting if it isn't made controversial to stir an emotional reaction. For example, Denisova hominin was declared to be a unique human species distinct from Neanderthals and modern humans based on genetic analysis, even though that analysis actually showed them to be related to both Neanderthals and the ancestors of modern Melanesians. Confusing controversies evoke more interest among the ignorant than anything that is properly understood and accurately portrayed. So, of course, creationists will seize any perceived controversy and will often manufacture them themselves. For example, a young Earth creationist once presented me with a list of mind quotations, including this one attributed to Richard Leakey, allegedly from an unidentified documentary. I was able to look up the other quotes to show how they were each incomplete statements, deceptively edited, out of context, or otherwise erroneously and deliberately misrepresented, but the PBS documentary wasn't available anymore. So I wrote to Dr. Leakey in Kenya, and he answered me saying that creationists were dishonest quote miners of astonishing stupidity. For example, look at this stool sample from Answers in Genesis University who gave a two-hour liathon at a church down the street from my house. So, the first we'll look at here is, is Lucy, popular. The drawing on the left, I'm sorry, the uh, sculpture on the left, depicting what Lucy's supposed to look like allegedly from the bones on the right. That's what they really found. And it's amazing how you can make feet without fossils of feet. Of course, this skid mark in your tidy whities is only looking at the very first of the species ever found. Since 1974, we found some with feet included. In fact, we found hundreds more individuals since then, just from this one species alone, to say nothing of the dozen or so species which the gullible leavers can neither account for nor honestly dismiss. Um, and the, as they've uh, discovered more fossils of this type of creature, it doesn't look anything like that. Doesn't look anything like Lucy, and even evolutionists themselves, they're the ones that do a lot of this research, so I just kind of view them all the time. 
And they'll say, nope, Lucy didn't look like that. In reality, she was just looked more like a knuckle, uh, uh, an ape that climbed and swung in the trees. Looked basically some kind of ape-like creature. Did not look like that at all. And they know that. And what's worse is it's still in the museum that looks like that. That's because they did look like that, you facially flatulating religitard, as I have already explained. Australopithecus afarensis proved to be a fully bipedal ape whose hands, feet, teeth, pelvis, skull, and other physical details were exactly what creationists challenged us to find, yet they're still pretending we never found it. Of course, scientists sometimes stir up controversy too, like when Elaine Morgan proposed her aquatic ape theory. I agreed with what she said about challenging the status quo defended by academia. How could I not agree when I go around saying that humans are still monkeys? I also have no alternate explanation for the layer of fat which humans have, but which she said other primates did not, although I could show that fat does occur in other primates and that such would be a beneficial condition of our being furless and yet living in a dynamically fluctuating climate. As for being aquatic, I will of course immediately concede that we humans do like water and probably have been casual swimmers for millions of years, but Ms. Morgan gave no indication that we were ever primarily aquatic. Not only that, but she also said things that were completely wrong. For example, humans have a small space in the roof of our mouth that other apes don't have, and this is what enables us to speak so many different sounds that other apes simply cannot make. Similarly, some birds can be taught to talk if the tips of their tongues are split or so I'm told. But Ms. Morgan seems unaware of that, and she says the reason humans can speak like no other ape is because we have control over our breath, such as no other primate has, owing to the fact that we have to hold our breath underwater when we swim, which she says no other primate does. But I have watched mere monkeys swimming underwater just for the fun of it, so I know that's not true. Another alleged controversy thrust in my face was the discovery of a relatively complete fossil hominin known as Ardi. My critics jeered that she was supposed to prove that Lucy wasn't the ancestral link we always said she was. But if they would look at my older posts, they would see that I already knew about Ardipithecus back in the mid-1990s, and I was a little surprised to see her show up in the media again. Back then, they were known only from fragments or a single tooth, not the cache we have now. What we have does not remove Australopithecus from the sequence. Ardipithecus only adds yet another link to an already fairly complete chain. While this newly announced collection also claims to be the death knell for the out of the savanna hypothesis, it does not radically alter or deviate in the least from my original interpretation and it offers evidence against the notion of aquatic apes. In summary, everything I read about the newly discovered details of Ardipithecus ramidus are the same things I had predicted when all we knew about it was fragmentary. I would have been surprised if it had been otherwise, but of course the announcement that evidence continues to compile confirming the consensus won't make sensational newspaper headlines.